Welcome, everybody. Welcome to World AIDS Day 2023. This is the 35th year, and we um, are glad to have so many of you coming in person. For those of you who are on Zoom, if you wish to uh, retain your privacy, you may want to um, make sure your name or your picture is not showing, if that's important to you because we will also be recording this and placing it on the website when, it, when the um, program is, is over. As a member of the World ASA Committee, I want to um, particularly thank Church of the Crossroads and um, Kahu David and the staff and the members. Uh, a few weeks ago, we had a uh, 40th anniversary of Hawaii Harm Reduction, uh, Hawaii Health and Harm Reduction Center, Life Foundation. And Jack Law made it a point to note the 100th anniversary of this church and that it began with uh, an inter, inter ethnic and inter, interfaith intention. And for 100 years, it's been an important, important place in the community. And for the HIV AIDS community, it has also been an important place. In the early 90s, uh, Crossroads hosted the first and continuing PWAC luncheons, the food basket, and that continued for many years. It's been a welcoming and safe space for people in the, in the HIV community. And I want to acknowledge Church of the Crossroads. And we now have uh, Raymond and the halal doing the opening oli.
Mahalo Kumu. Aloha folks, welcome. On behalf of the organizers and the participants in this World AIDS Day gathering, let me welcome you to this sacred place, to this spacious moment, to this gathering of World AIDS Day. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> During this day, across the many time zones of this world, hour upon hour, people have been gathering in solidarity, in remembrance, in commitment, and now in one of the last time zones of this world, as it makes its turn, we gather to add our presence, our voices, our expressions to this special day. Welcome to you all. Aloha. I ask that you would join me for a moment of prayer. <coughs> 35 years, oh God, 35 years we have gathered, sometimes emboldened, sometimes discouraged, sometimes thankful, and in other times despondent. We are grateful for those who toil diligently in search of cure and relief, those who work tirelessly in the face of distrust and discrimination, those who hold hands, who wipe away tears, and those who have had to say goodbye far too often. Be present with us, we pray on this day, present with those who gather in the midst of never forgotten loss, present with those who are on the front lines and those who are the support crews, present with the researchers and the receivers, present with the organizers and the organized, present with all who walk through these doors, log onto their screens, or just offer themselves to this moment in whatever way that they can. These, these, O oh Holy One, are the stigma fighters, the tellers of a different story, the welcomers, the greeters, the never give uppers. Be with them, Holy One, be with them in the struggles, the successes, be with them that we might indeed bring AIDS to an end. Amen. We'll now have the reading of the World, World AIDS Day Proclamation from Mayor Blangiardi by Kalani Hanley. Hello, my name is Kalani. I am a housing case manager at Gregory House Programs. And this is the uh, proclamation uh, from Mayor Blangiardi. And um, I'll be reading a revised version of this. Whereas World AIDS Day is observed worldwide to unite people in the fight against HIV, show support for those living with HIV and to honor individuals who have died from an AIDS-related illness. And whereas 2023 marks the 35th commemoration of this day in Hawaii with the theme Fight Stigma and AIDS. To let us all recognize we are more alike than different, work cooperatively to end the epidemic and serve our community together in providing care for people living with HIV. And whereas the Hawaii to Zero campaign aims to end the HIV epidemic in Hawaii with zero new HIV infections, zero deaths related to HIV and zero HIV related stigma and Whereas people living with HIV often experience loneliness and isolation, and it is critical that they receive appropriate HIV medical care and support. And while great progress has been made in the treatment for those living with HIV and AIDS, and new prevention strategies can prevent new infections, there is still no cure for HIV or AIDS. Therefore, I, Rick Blangiardi, Mayor of the City and County of Honolulu, do hereby proclaim December 1st, 2023 as World AIDS Day to encourage residents to join in the fight against HIV and AIDS, support for people living with HIV, and honor those who have passed away from AIDS-related illnesses, and to extend sincere appreciation to the individuals, groups, and organizations providing housing, medical, 
social and advocacy services in our community. Thank you. Thank you, Kalani. We also have a proclamation from Governor Ige, and we'll have both of those available for viewing in the reception after the program. Uh, next, we have uh, Frank Akima and the uh, Halau doing their uh, entrance Oli. This is an Oli that was written for World AIDS Day by Puakea Nogelmeyer, and we are grateful to have Frank and his uh, Halau members joining us tonight. your patchwork under the sun and people gathered for miles around to witness your quilt spread on the ground and then they called out your name oh yes they called out your name and you Just like a patchwork quilt Ooh. Well, there were men and women Mothers and fathers Sisters and brothers Daughters and sons And children and babies And lovers and friends They all lay before me Sewn into one And then they called out your name Oh yes, they called out your name And you will live forever Know that I'll be loving you Just like a patchwork of meaning and your lives have joy you touch so many people many more than you know and you wrap yourselves around me as I walk along these roads you're letting me feel your beautiful souls I feel the warmth of your life I feel the Just like a patchwork quilt My heart spills over Flowing with tears I cry for your suffering And for your short and years And I'll take you with me As I walk away Remembering Who've died with it? I will remember your name.
like a patchwork quilt. You know that I'll be loving you just like a patchwork quilt. We're now having the piano with Don Conover. Thank you, Don. Thank you for asking me. What a beautiful way to begin this program. I've enjoyed every moment so far. I was asked to choose two songs that would be meaningful to those who are here today. When you walk through a storm, hold your head up high. Don't be afraid of the dark. At the end of the storm is a golden sky and the sweet silver song of a lark. Walk on through the wind, walk on through the rain, though your dreams be tossed and blown. Walk on, walk on with hope in your heart and you'll never walk alone. You'll never walk alone. Thank you. And this one means a lot to so many of us, everyone here. And if you'd like to sing along with me. And I never thought I'd feel this way And as far as I'm concerned I'm 
glad I got the chance to say that I do believe I love you and if I should ever go away well then close your eyes and try to feel the way I do today and if you can remember Keep smiling, keep smiling, know that you're, can always count on me, for sure. That's what friends are for, for good times, for good times and bad times. I'll be on your side forever, forevermore. That's what friends are for. Well, you came and opened me, and now there's just so much I see. And by the way, I thank you. And then for the times when we're apart, well, then close your eyes and know these words are coming from my heart. And if you can remember, everybody keep smiling, keep smiling, keep smiling, knowing you can always count on me. For sure, that's what friends are for in good times and bad times. I'll be on your side forevermore. That's what friends are for. That's what friends are for. That's what friends are for. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Uh, we now have uh, remarks from Tony Sanchez from the Hawaii Center for AIDS. Uh, thank you, Tom. Um, hi, everyone. <laughs> so I am honored to be here tonight uh, to talk to you about the fight to end stigma. Stigma is a major barrier that, uh, to the well-being and dignity of people living with HIV. It affects their access to health care, social, social support, and employment opportunities. It also fuels the spread of the virus by discouraging people from getting tested and, getting, and treated. That's why we need to challenge the myths and stereotypes that fuel the stigma and discrimination. Before I go any further, let me introduce myself. My name is Anthony Sanchez, uh, but you can call me Tony, um, and I am a research associate at the Hawaii Center for AIDS at the medical school. I also, um, I work on research projects related to HIV and other infectious diseases. I am the vice commissioner to the Hawaii Gate Kickball League that um, supports uh, a huge portion of our community here, and I am also on the board for the Hawaii LGBT Legacy Foundation. Um, I am also a newly open and proud member of the um, HIV positive community. So, I, and I've been living with HIV for a couple of years now. I, I am grateful for the support and care that I have received from my family, friends, and healthcare providers, especially to my wonderful doctor at the VA. Um, in the next few minutes, I will share with you some of the challenges and opportunities that we face um, in the fight and stigma. I will also share some of the stories and lessons that I have learned from personal experience in hope that by the end of my talk, uh, you'll be motivated to continue the fight to make a difference in your own communities. My interest in HIV research started a few years ago when I tested positive for the virus. The day I tested positive, I had actually gone to the clinic um, with the assumption that I was going to be prescribed PrEP. Uh, 
you know, but that's not how it turned out. Uh, so I had been meaning to make this appointment and to follow through for a while, but it kept, but I kept putting it off. You know, I thought that I was, you know, being careful. I wasn't. Um, so when I received the news, I froze. There were so many emotions and negative thoughts that had me spiraling and ulti ultimately left me motionless. At the time, I did not want to acknowledge or accept the reality of what had happened. As a pre-med major, I knew that some of the risks and benefits of treatment, I knew that HIV was not a death sentence anymore, but a chronic condition that could be managed with medication. I knew that I had to take care of myself physically and mentally, but I really, really struggled with getting treatment. I followed my doctor's advice and started therapy immediately. She was very supportive and understanding. She helped me cope with the emotional and psychological aspects of living with HIV. She also helped me stick to a daily regimen of antiviral drugs. I am so grateful for her care and guidance. It did take me a couple of months of intense therapy to accept my status as a fact only. A fact that motivated the, the curious science, uh, scientist in me to learn more and to do more. I wanted to be a part of the solution and not the problem. I wanted to make a difference, not only for myself, but for others like me. So that's basically kind of my story, uh, which probably is not is nothing like to those that have lost their lives to AIDS. So I got infected, I eventually got treatment, and you would think that I'm like, okay now, right? But, you know, the truth was, that I was not okay for a long time. I struggled with stigma and the shame of living with HIV. I felt like I had to hide that part of myself from the world. I was afraid of being judged, rejected, and discriminated against because of my status. That's why today's topic is so important to me. The fight to end HIV stigma is not just a matter of public health, but also of, a, of human rights. Stigma affects the lives of millions of people living with HIV around the world, and it prevents them from accessing care and support they need. You know, I haven't talked about my situation uh, with a lot of people until recently when I attended the uh, Hawaii 2.0 conference that was held by uh, the Hawaii, uh, Hawaii Center for AIDS. I had the opportunity to share my story with many amaz amazing human beings who loved me and accept me for who I am. They inspired me to be open and honest about my experience. They also showed me that I am not alone in this fight and that my story was not too different from others. So now you may be wondering how I can speak about something so personal uh, without being afraid of how people will react. You know, well, you know, I won't lie to you. It's, it's not easy. Um, you know, it takes courage and confidence. It also takes a lot of support and solidarity but I believe it's worth it. Because speaking out, I can challenge the stigma and the stereotypes that surround HIV. I can also educate and empower others who may be going through the same thing, and I can and hope that one day we will live in a world where HIV is no longer a source of shame, but a source of strength. When the World Aid Day Committee was looking for a speaker or the remarks today, uh, they wanted uh, sort of a younger voice to share their perspective. And I was a little hesitant to, to raise my hand because I don't consider myself young anymore. I am 33 and in the queer community, that's kind of ancient, yeah? <laughs> but they chose me anyways and I'm flattered. <laughs> uh, but I also felt nervous because I didn't know what to say. You know, I haven't been very open, like I said, about my status, uh, unlike many others, you know, who are more courageous and outspoken. Um, but I decided to dig deep uh, to share what I've been really struggling with, and that is a stigma that I had imposed on myself. To understand what I mean by self-stigma, I did some research online, you know, and I found a study uh, titled The Role of Self-Stigma in the in the pathways of HIV-related stigma to the quality of life among people living with HIV, published in 2021. The study examined how, how perceived and experienced stigma from society affect the well-being of people living with HIV and how self-stigma mediates this relationship. The study was based on a survey of about 1,700 participants, mostly men, who were receiving care at the hospital in in a hospital in Amsterdam. The study defined public stigma as, 
and I quote, a negative the negative beliefs, emotions, and behaviors that are held in society about HIV, such as anger, disgust, avoidance, or abuse towards people living with HIV, end quote. This type of stigma can be perceived or experienced by people living with HIV. And cell stigma, on the other hand, was defined as a person with a stigmatized condition um, is aware of the public stigma and internalizes the negative beliefs in society and accepts their validity. This can lead to feelings of shame, guilt, fear, and low self-esteem. The study found that both public stigma and self-stigma had a negative impact on the quality of life outcomes in people living with HIV, affecting their disclosure, mental health, sexual functioning, sleep quality, self-esteem, and general health. The, stu the study also found that self-stigma mediated the relationship between public stigma and the quality of life. So this study really resonated with me because it described what I had been feeling for a long time. I have been, I have been aware of the stigma that exists in society towards people living with HIV, and I had internalized it. I have felt ashamed, guilty, fearful, and unworthy because of my status. I have also avoided dis uh, disclosing it to others for the fear of being rejected, discriminated, or discriminated against. I let stigma affect the qual my quality of life, and I know that I'm not the only one. But I have also learned to overcome self-stigma by loving myself unconditionally. Loving myself has been the most important step in my healing journey. It has made me a stronger and more confident and more, res and more resilient. It has also made me more open and honest about my experience. And <laughs> it, it kind of has made me not care about you know, what other people think of me. I, I know that I am valuable and worthy regardless of my status. I want to share this message with you and with everyone who is living with HIV. You know, I know we say this a lot, but you, are, you, you guys are truly not alone. Uh, and you are not defined by your status. You are beautiful and amazing just the way you are. You deserve love and respect from yourself and from others. Don't let stigma hold you back from living the best life, your best life, okay? Um, and the study did, you know, suggest that there should be more research on interventions to reduce self-stigma. Um, and I think one of the best ways to do that is to create a culture of openness and support in our community. We should not be afraid to talk about our health, our challenges, and our successes. We should not be ashamed to seek help or to help others. We should not be silent or invisible. We should be proud, loud, and visible. We should share our stories and our insights and our wisdom. We should educate, empower, and inspire each other. We should celebrate our diversity, our strength, and our courage. We should be a force for change, for justice, and for hope. That's why I am here today to speak to you from my heart, because the fight continues. And lastly, I just want to thank you, know, thank you all for listening, for caring, and for being part of this fight. Thank you to Tom, Andrew, and the World Eight Day Committee and for allowing me to share my voice. And a special thank you to Dr. Shikuma and Dr. Chow for, and all healthcare providers out there for what you do. Um, and also a special thanks to my family, friends, and partner, and all those fellow warriors who have supported me and loved me unconditionally. You are all amazing and I am grateful for you. And I hope that you have a wonderful evening and enjoy the rest of the program. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. We now have the Gay Men's Chorus of Honolulu.
Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now have the presentation of the Suzanne Richmond Crum Award with Timothy McCormick and Dr. Diane Felton. Good evening. Um, wonderful, wonderful um, uh, presentation this evening. Thank you. Um, I'm Tim McCormick. I'm with the Hawaii Department of Health, the Harm Reduction Services Branch, which has responsibility for HIV, sexually transmitted infections, and adult viral hepatitis. One of the programs in our, one of the sections in our branch is the HIV Medical Management Services section. It's often referred to as HBAM, which is the name of the oldest program in the section. Suzanne Richmond Crum was the director of, the, of this section from the very beginning of the HPAM program until her death in 2004. Since then, the Department of Health and the Harm Reduction Services Branch has taken the opportunity at World AIDS Day to pause and remember Suzanne's spirit and dedication by recognizing the contributions of an individual, their contributions to um, outstanding services for uh, outstanding HIV services in Hawaii. This is the 20th year that this award has been given. When Suzanne started, we didn't yet have effective antiretroviral medication. The discrimination, fear, and stigma were overwhelming. Program participants were, were passing away every day. New diagnoses were increasing. On top of that, there was a constant struggle. Suzanne faced a constant struggle to get additional resources to keep the, the to keep up with the need for the increasing need for services. And she faced constant battles to keep staff, keep staff positions funded. So she was very tough and she was a fighter, but she was also really warm. She was hopeful. She was empathetic and really cared about her clients and about people living with HIV in general. I was very fortunate to know Suzanne and to work with her about seven, for about seven years, and I know that a lot of people here also knew her. But as the years go by, almost 20 years now, there are more and more people who are, who are part of our community, part of our HIV community, who did not know Suzanne. And so I'm really happy that we've continued to, pre to present this award, that we honor and remember Suzanne, and we continue to acknowledge the tremendous contributions of the current and the past 19 honorees. So let's hear more about this year's honoree. And for that, um, Dr. Diana Felton is here to say a few words about the honoree and present the award. Dr. Felton is the Chief of the Communicable Disease and Public Health Nursing Division um, in the Health Department. And she's been in her role for almost a year. And in that very short time, she's already dedicated a very strong commitment to HIV services a genuine caring and empathy for the patient, for the individuals that we serve, and a real respect for the expertise of the community and community agencies. So it's my pleasure to introduce Diana Felton. Hello, uh, as Tim mentioned, I'm Diana. Uh, it is such an honor for me to be here today with all of you. Um, and as we come together in acknowledgement of World's AIDS Day, in memory of those who have passed away, in recognition of those living with HIV and AIDS, in support of their families and friends and caregivers, and in appreciation of all the dedicated healthcare and social services providers working with those affected with HIV and AIDS. As Tim mentioned on World AIDS Day, the Harm Reduction Services Branch of the Hawaii Department of Health presents the Suzanne Richmond Crum Award to a community member for outstanding contributions providing HIV and AIDS services in Hawaii. And this award is dedicated to the memory of Suzanne Richmond Crum. Suzanne passed away in August of 2004, and as Tim mentioned, she served as the director of the Hawaii Seropositive Zero Positivity and Medical Management Program at the Department of Health. Those who knew Suzanne admired the pride and commitment that she exhibited in all aspects of her professional life. This award is established in her memory and honor and of the expertise, competence, and compassion that Suzanne demonstrated in her HIV work. I'm so happy to announce that this year's award goes to Ms. Kiva Lei Cadena. I 
have a little to tell you about Kiva before she gets the mic. But Kiva began her work at Life Foundation, now the Hawaii Health and Harm Reduction Center, as an HIV and hepatitis C testing specialist, then as a linkage to care specialist, and finally as a community engagement coordinator. Her focus was to provide educational and empowerment opportunities to people living with HIV. As an outreach worker, Kiva's main effort was to connect those newly diagnosed with HIV to medical care, case management, and social support. She provided support to people living with HIV and their partners, including through partner notifications and referrals. She also facilitated weekly HIV support groups hosted by Life Foundation and facilitated the annual Positive Living for Us, or PLUS, retreat. In 2015, recognizing that there was not enough representation of people living with HIV meaningfully involved in addressing HIV and other social injustice issues in Hawaii, she developed the Positive Organizing Project, or POP, Ohana, a leadership network of people across the state living with HIV. This led, effort led to encouraging new advocates and service providers in every part of our state. As a Native Hawaiian woman of trans experience living with HIV, Kiva not only shares her story and inspires us here in Hawaii, she has gained national recognition for her efforts, including being named one of PAWS Magazine's 2019 Most Influential People in HIV. Kiva is also a member of the Positively Trans National Advisory Board and a regional representative to the National Native HIV Network. Kiva joined Kumakahi Health and Wellness, formerly Hawaii Island HIV AIDS Foundation, in 2020 as a program manager for prevention services. She quickly increased their capacity, formalized processes, and enhanced Kumakahi's reputation in the community. Her success led to promotion in 2021 to be Kumakahi's Director of Harm Reduction Services and Community Engagement. Her impact has continued to grow in her work at Kumakahi Health and Wellness. Kiva is a true role model and embodies the spirit of the Suzanne Richmond Crum Award. She has been effective in reaching out to people who are underserved, disadvantaged, and stigmatized, especially members of the Native Hawaiian and Pacific Island community. She's a true advocate for vulnerable populations and is an inspiration to us here in Hawaii and beyond. Please join me in honoring Kivali Kadena with the 2023 Suzanne Richmond Crum Award. Thank you. 
Wow. Wow. Um, I really did try to um, write a speech today, but um, I could not put the words on paper, um, what I was feeling in my head and in my heart about um, today and about this really special award. So first, I just want to say mahalo nunui to the Department of Health and the Harm Reduction Services Branch and the Selection Committee for um, this year's Suzanne Richmond Quam Award. Um, as I walked into this room and as I looked around, um, the amount of faces of heroes and sheroes of people that do HIV work here in Hawaii. Um, you all deserve this award just as much as I do. Um, probably even more, honestly. Um, I walked into this work because of my own lived experience, because of my own um, hurt and trauma. And so many people in this room saved my life, literally saved my life. I would not be standing here if it wasn't for people like Raymond Alejo, who would come to my home and make sure that I was taking my medicine. She's on Zoom, but... Um, but my case manager for many, many years, her name is Lale Kazimavazi. And I got to have a text conversation with her this morning to thank her for being there for me and for sticking it out, getting me housing, making sure I could keep the lights on, making sure that I had food to eat, never judging me, but always showing me love. There is hundreds of case managers in this state that continue to do that work every single day. You all deserve this award. There's hundreds of nurses and doctors and clinic workers and medical assistants that have continued to save the lives of people living with HIV, including me. People like Nancy Hanks, who's retired now, but was a longtime nurse at the Clint Spencer Clinic with the Center, Hawaii Center for AIDS. I would bring my dog with me to my doctor's appointment because we were homeless. And if I couldn't bring my dog, I couldn't come to the doctors. And so this crazy, rambunctious pit bull, may you rest in love. would come with me to these doctor's appointments. And Nancy had never said a word. She'd make sure that he had water, and we'd joke around about how rambunctious he was, and nobody ever gave me a second look. So I kept going. I kept doing what they said I could do, I should do, because they made it OK for me to do it in my own way. When I was diagnosed with HIV in August of 2004, I was living in San Francisco. I was um, barely surviving. I've got to be careful with this story because my mom is here. <laughs> <laughs> I was barely surviving, and I was doing whatever I needed to do to get by. There we go. <laughs> And I remember I was telling my husband this story on the drive to work the other day as I was thinking about what I was going to say while I was accepting this award. And I remember walking in to, you had, you had to wait two weeks to get your HIV test results back in 2004. It wasn't a 15 minute rapid test like how we have now. So I, I really um, am shocked that I went back two weeks later, because I just was not the responsible person to go back two weeks later to get these results. I probably would have avoided it, but I was getting so sick for about a year and a half, and I had things like MRSA and shingles and staph infections, and it was just nonstop. 
for, for um, over a year. And, um, and a girlfriend of mine told me, um, nobody had ever said this right to my face, but she said, Kivi, you need to go take an HIV test. And, um, and I, that was kind of heavy that actually someone would say that like straight out. And, um, and so I did, I, I followed that direction from one of my good girlfriends and I went and I got the test and two weeks later when I was going back and I'm walking into the API Wellness Center in San Francisco, California, um, I remember I was carrying a piece of pizza in my hand and I remember getting ready to walk up the stairs and I just kind of took a pause to myself and I said, he wouldn't do this to me wouldn't do this to me. He gave me too much already. He's not going to give me this too. And I walked into that testing room and um, the results were HIV positive. And I instantly started to cry and I was, a, uh, I was a bully in the streets at that time and I wanted to beat up the poor kid who was giving me this test result. And, um, and I had him go down the hall to grab an, a, an older trans woman who was facilitating a support group who was very close to me. Her name was Melanie Elenecki. She's from Waimanalo, Oahu. Her family is Pa and Elenecki. She was a big influence in my life and she still continues to be that. She walked into that room and she grabbed me and she said, this is not a death sentence. And I didn't hear the words that she said, I just cried and I just kind of let it go in her chest as she's holding me and I'm crying. And all the things that I was thinking that day was how nobody was ever going to love me again and I'll never find somebody to get old with. I'll never make my family proud. My family would be embarrassed and ashamed of me now. And that I knew how I was going to die. I knew that I was going to die from HIV. And those thoughts and those feelings, they were, they stuck with me for a long time. So much that I avoided getting into services. You had a choice back then if you wanted to start HIV care or if you didn't. And of course, I didn't want to start. I didn't want to think about it. I, I, I really did tell the doctor this. I said, Doc, I'm Hawaiian. I'm going to eat poi. I'm going to eat raw fish. I'm going to eat, and I'll get better. I really, really believe that. Please, kanakas out there, that's not, that's not the regimen. <laughs> but I did say that. And, um, and I went on my way. And it wasn't until I came home for Christmas in 2006, I got very sick and I walked um, out of the bedroom into the living room on Christmas morning out in Kaneohe with my mom and my family and uh, my face was swollen from another staph infection and um, I couldn't hide that I was ill. I, f I truly feel like my mom always knew but she just said we gotta take you to the doctors. And I went to the doctors and that's when things started to change. And the reason why I tell you this is because I really, truly, truly believe that there was some kind of powerful alignment that I just didn't, I just still don't understand. I was diagnosed with HIV in 2004 and I started taking medication in 2006. And if any of you know the history of HIV medication in 2006, the first one pill, one a day came out and it saved my life. I was gonna say something else, but I forgot we're in a church. <laughs> <laughs> it saved my life really because in the beginning of, of starting HIV treatment, I, um, I wanted to make some contribution. I felt like, okay, I know I'm not gonna make it through this. I haven't done anything with my life. I kind of messed everything up. I've been on the streets, I'm hooked on drugs, I'm doing things, what I, doing things that I needed to do to survive and I wasn't proud of them. And I just didn't know what kind of footprint I could leave, what kind of legacy I could leave, what kind of contribution to life I could make. And so when I went to the Spencer Clinic 
and they offered me to join a clinical trial, I said, okay, this is what I can do. I can be a part of the solution. I can be a part of people learning how, what best medications are out there. I'll get on a clinical trial. And I failed miserably. It was such a complicated thing. I would have to take a pill in the morning and a pill in the evening and with this pill every other day. And, and it was really, really complicated and I kept failing. And finally, Nancy, she said to me, Kiva, you know, we have these one pill, one a day regimens and, um, and you, maybe you should just take that. Don't worry about the clinical trial. And I said, okay, yeah, let's do that. Let's take this one pill, one a day. And within four months, I was undetectable. A pill is called a tripla. So, mahalo kia kua for that one pill, one a day that saved my life. And I went on with my life and I went on with the crazy decisions and the living that I was doing um, until, until it all came to a head in 2010. Um, I just felt like all of the things that I had done was weighing on my spirit. I hadn't made a difference in my life, in my family's life. I hadn't made my family proud. I stressed them out. I worried them. I scared them. I made them sad. Um, and I wasn't proud of any of it. And um, I made a deal with God. And he doesn't make deals. But that's the only kind of negotiating I knew how to do, was I did deals, right? And, and the deal was, make my life better or I'm done. And, um, and that night, the, my partner um, beat me up for the, uh, he really beat me up. That's just, sorry. Um, and so I realized that, like, that the deal wasn't gonna go through. So I, um, in four handfuls, I took an entire bottle of Tylenol PM and, and I tried to end my life that night. It was January 1st, 2010. And um, I ended up in the hospital and I ended up in ICU. And, um, and Dr. Dominic Chow, I don't think he's here. I didn't see him. Hi. <laughs> And he doesn't, I, I don't think he really likes this. I think it gets him very uncomfortable, but I told this story to my executive director this morning, and, and he said, you know, that is really, um, that's really amazing that you remember this. But Dr. Dominic Chow came to the hospital. He was my doctor, and he was prescribing me my medications and checking up on me every three months like he was supposed to. And um, he came January 2nd, 2010, to my hospital room, and he was standing outside of the door, and his son was probably maybe three or four years old at the time. And I just couldn't believe that he would bring his son to the hospital to check on me. And I couldn't believe that he would come during the holidays um, out of his own personal time to make sure that I was okay. And I remember hearing him say to the nurse, any phone calls or any stressful visitors you have them come see me. Don't make them, don't bother her with it. Let her worry about her. And I felt so protected in that moment. Dr. Chow, I felt so seen and so protected. And I never ever forgot that. And those are the kind of commitments that people that do this work have been doing for me and for countless others. I am not the only person that Dr. Chow has come to see in the hospital room many, many times for all the emergencies that we bring upon ourselves. I am not the only person that Nancy Hanks let bring their animal or their crazy partner or their drug-induced hype. I'm sure there were plenty others, I'm sure. <laughs> but that's just my experience and I just can't understand how all these years later, you folks think that I'm just as good as them. That the commitment that I've made to myself has actually reflected into the work and to the lives of the people that I've worked with and worked for for the last 12 years. I didn't set out to do this work. I wanted to be a showgirl, I wanted to be a model, and I wanted to be an actress. <laughs> so
So you will see me in Zoom meetings with a full face. You will see me at conferences with stilettos. You will see me trying my best. <laughs> but I started this work because of 12-step recovery. In the ninth step, it says, we made amends wherever possible, except when to do so would harm them or others. And I didn't know how I was going to give back after all of the things that I had done to so many people out there in these streets, literally right here on this street. <laughs> and right down the road in the Koile apartments and the next neighborhood over in Waikiki, <laughs> three miles down in Chinatown. I didn't know how I was gonna make up for the, the lives that I had um, affected by my reckless behavior. And, um, and when this divine alignment happened, um, a role at Life Foundation appeared itself to me, and, um, and I took it. And that was in 2012. And if anybody knows the history of the National HIV and AIDS Strategy, it was updated, wasn't it, Nagat, in 2012. <laughs> And they did something amazing, and it's a, it's a Native Hawaiian proverb. It says, nana ike kumu, look to the source. And the National HIV and AIDS Strategy said to change prevention work. Of course, keep educating, keep addressing stigma, keep testing, and keep doing outreach in bars and nightclubs and in dangerous, uh, in dangerous environments, public sex areas and all of those things. But it also said, look to the source. If you want to stop the spread of HIV, support people living with HIV. And uh, a mere outreach worker that was doing prevention work for HIV positive people became a linkage to care specialist. It became that link between prevention services and the case management care services, those two pillars of aid service organizations around the world, around the country. And I became this bridge between those folks in the prevention department and those folks in the care department to link all of these people, newly diagnosed or just getting back into the care, to care or just needing some extra support. I became that. And I got to use my own story to be relevant to these clients and these people that I were working with. Um, and I got to facilitate support groups, and, and I met some of the most amazing, amazing, talented people with amazing stories that were just like me. And I felt so honored and privileged to work with them. And I realized that there was so much talent, but everybody was continuing to do for us, and nobody was realizing that we could actually kind of do for ourselves if you gave us some strong legs to stand on the way that people had done for me and i wanted to do that for other people living with hiv in hawaii i wanted to build up their their legs i wanted to build up their muscle i wanted to build up their confidence and um and so we just started teaching them how to do it I'd go to a meeting and I'd hear these things and I'd be like, hey, go back to the support group. This is what I learned and this is what I was on. This is how they talk about it and this is how funding works. And then I'd go to this other meeting and I'd go back to these support groups and I'd go back to these retreats and I'd tell more people and I'd say, if you think that I'm special because I'm doing it, you could do it too. And it just, tr this, this trickle effect of people that were becoming empowered and comfortable and, um, and falling in love with themselves. It meant something to me. It meant something to me that they um, trusted me so much that these people living with HIV that were under the care of our case management team that would come to our food pantry and come to our luncheons and different events that they were holding actually trusted me enough to let me into their lives and offer them my own experience and offer them my own support. And I guess, what I'm trying to say is that I realized that I fell into who I am as a mahu. Um, I, I didn't have a lot of guidance as a child, as a young person, as a teenager, and growing into adulthood. I didn't have a lot of guidance because nobody understood about being mahu and that it was okay. And today we're so privileged because 
we are realizing that Mahu people have a place in Native Hawaiian society and here in Hawaii. And that's another piece of that divine alignment of all of these things that were happening in my favor, right? Understanding that I'm my koko, who I come from and my, who my kupunas brought me into this world to be, they said it was okay to be mahu. And not only that it was okay to be mahu, but I had a special magic about me. And all you other mahu in this room, you have a special magic about you that is healing, that is nurturing, that is caretaking, that is educating. And we just pull from these talents and these skills and this confidence, and we give it to our community because in turn, it's an exchange of aloha and mana. The more aloha that we share, the more mana that we receive. And it gives me the ability to share more aloha, to give myself the ability to receive more mana. And that is the Hawaiian concept that if I didn't know this, I couldn't embrace it. If I couldn't embrace it, I couldn't be it. And if I couldn't be it, I couldn't share it. So I'm especially proud to stand here because I'm the first transgender mahu to receive this award in 20 years. I wasn't pausing here, thank you. Thank you. I'm the first transgender woman to become the director of a department of an aid service organization in Hawaii. And I'm the first transgender Native Hawaiian to sit on the CDC HRSA Advisory Council for HIV, Hepatitis, and Viral, and viral Hepatitis and STDs. It's a long name. And I don't think that these things happen by mistake. So many of you people in this room nurtured me and mentored me and taught me how to do this work. You taught me how to show up. You taught me how to be fearless. Uncle Raymond, you taught me how to speak with aloha. You taught me how to just be myself and use my lived experiences as my education. You taught me not to be ashamed of where I was and just know where I'm going. You taught me to show up and show well. And so that's what I continue to do. And so every single win, every single moment, I've done this alongside all of these amazing sheroes and heroes that believed in me, that gave me space to learn, that gave me space to mess up, that gave me space to mihi, that gave me space to start over. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Paul Grossbeck. Thank you, Trisha Kajimura. Thank you, Nandi Ishikawa. Thank you, Peter Silva. These leaders in HIV believed in me and gave me space to learn and grow and be. He can't, he can't be here, but I want to say a very, very special thank you. I think that his work and his commitment and his contribution has been under-recognized for so many, many years. But this man, this mahu, he has been my mentor, he has been my friend, he has been the shoulder that I've cried on, he has fought for me, he has cried with me, he has celebrated with me, and we've traveled around the country together. I cannot ever, ever, unrecognized that I would not be standing here today if it wasn't for my friend and my mentor, Kunane Dreyer. He's such a fun and humble person that he would never, he would never own any of the things that I just said. But he is absolutely my saving grace and he gave me a career that I could not only be there for my community, but I could be there for my family. So I stand here with a lot of pride and a lot of emotion, and, and I hope I got everything out. I'm, I'm sure I'm gonna be driving back to our hotel tonight and thinking like, I forgot this and I forgot that and I forgot this, but I really just want to say thank you, thank you so much. Please understand that it takes the community to do this work.
We have the solutions in science. We know that prevention medication works. We know that HIV medication works. We know that undetectable viral loads cannot spread HIV. We know that staying connected to a doctor means that people need housing and mental health care, that they need substance abuse treatment and they need support. They need case management services and medical insurance and peer navigation. And it trickles back down to the community. In the state of Hawaii, you all should be so damn proud of yourselves. We have an 84% viral suppression rate for people living with HIV in this state. 84%. <laughs> the best in the country. And it's because we work from our heart and it's because of all of those folks that are standing in the back. All of those amazing, yeah. What I mean to say is, is that we have the solutions in science. The puka is the community. It's the people, the most undervalued and underserved and vulnerable people in our state. People that don't have documents to get them into medical care. People that don't have housing. People that are addicted to drugs. People that don't think that health care is meant for them people that are unable to stay adherent to medication because they cannot do it by themselves. It takes community people to do this work, to get them in so that those medications can do what they're supposed to do. So please continue to support trans women who are doing this work because we're here and we've been here for a long time. A shout out to Nalani Anderson, a shout out to Madeline Sessa Passara, a shout out to Kathy Kapua, a shout out to Shalani Placencia, and, all, and to Tiare Sua and to Bianca Tasaka, to all of these trans women that are doing this work across the state. They have made a difference in the community. They have been the bridge that have brought community people into HIV services for decades. A shout out to all of these other folks from the LGBT communities. If it wasn't for the community, we would not have the services and the quality of services that have brought us to a viral suppression rate of 84% in our state. And I just want to make sure that we understand that and we know that. We had a beautiful conference just this, a few months ago, um, the Hawaii to Zero Conference. And I really would love to see more of the amazing work that the community is doing be presented and be represented at these conferences because I believe that the magic is in the hearts of the people that are doing this work on the front lines. So mahalo to all of you. I share this award with you. I did not do this by, your, by myself. Larnie, I see you. I love you. Thank you. Larnie took me shopping for my first outfit when I had to go to a, to a conference in Washington, D.C. She didn't want me to look messed up, and she, me and her went shopping together. Like, these are the mentors and the guides and, the, and, the, and the, just the beautiful people that have been there for me to make sure that I could do the work that I've been doing. So I, I'm just, I share this with all of you. I did not do this by myself. I stand on the shoulders of so many people that believed in me, that supported me, that saved my life, to my family, my mom, Twinkle Mokihana, to my dad, Arthur David, to my brother, to my brother, David Arthur, to my cousins, to my uncle and my auntie. Thank you all for being here and for, for supporting me and for being a part of my life and for believing in me. To my husband, I love you. Thank you for believing in me. Thank you for loving me anyway. I'm a lot to handle and I know it. But I'm really proud to say that I stand with and on the backs of so many people who love and support me. So those things that were said on, in August of 2004, I'll never find love again. Well, I found him. I'll never make my family proud. I made him proud. My hula family, thank you. My hula family, you are my peace, my therapy. I love you folks. None of those things that I believed that day are true. None of them came true. And I'm proud of myself. Um, I didn't do this alone, but thank you, thank you. Mahalo nunui.
Well, Kiva, you may not become a showgirl, but you are a star. began our time this evening by welcoming you to this space. I want to end our time by thanking you for saying mahalo to all of you for being here. To say mahalo because as a pastor of this wonderful congregation, it is one of my dreams. One of the passions that, uh, that keeps, that fuels me is for this space, for this place to be utilized in such a way. For us to be a place where such grace, such a spirit of aloha, such a sense of challenge and justice 
such a place of resilience gives, is given voice, is given music, is given presentation, is given dance. Mahalo to all of you for being here. Kiva, mahalo for your words. I, I was thinking of my 28-year-old daughter um, who would be so thrilled to hear what you have to say, would be so thrilled to be present with you all. So mahalo, mahalo to you all. The, the evening will continue when we are Paul here in just a minute by asking you all to take a moment and walk across the courtyard and there is food and show and who knows what else Andrew has planned for us as we get, get over there. So please take time to be gathered with one another. Will you join with me a pulikako for just a moment of prayer? Holy One, we gather together and we remember and we thank the heroes and the sheroes amongst us, those who have gone before us, those who are yet still to come. We are grateful for the chance that each of us has to leave a footprint in this world. That no matter where we have come from, no matter what we have done, that there is always the opportunity for your aloha to touch our lives, for your breath to come into us, for us to be able to be whom you have created us to be and to share that aloha, to share that spirit, that mana with one another. Be present with us as we end this evening together. Be present with us as we continue in the daily life and the daily walk that we have. Allow us to indeed be a people of aloha in this community, in this world. Amen. Let us be united. Let us be united as one body. Let us be united in one breath. Let us be united in one love. Amen. come to the reception. Thank you. Valeu